first record I ever bought. Hold on, let me see. The first record I bought. I don't know about the first record I ever bought. The first album I ever bought. The first record I ever bought. This has to be uh, the first record I ever bought with my own money. And uh, obviously it's Run DMC's Raising Hell. Huge, influential album for me. And I guarantee most cats from my generation. But uh, yeah, man, I remember when this came out. I saw an ad for it in uh, the Arizona Republic. They were selling it at a uh, tower. So I gave my mom some money and uh, asked her to go down and pick it up for me. So she went down and drove down like she was working down that way and she went and picked it up and brought this home for me. So this is the first album I ever bought with my own money. Run this is raising out. Classic. Now here we go, here we go. Yeah. First record I ever bought was UTFO. I bought this when I was like 16 years old, back in Milwaukee. Um, I bought this from a record store called Rent a Record. And it was actually a record store where you can go in there and actually rent records. A lot of DJs back in the days used to go in there and uh, they would be doing a party that weekend. So they go in there and they, they buy five or six records or rent them rather. You could like buy them for like $7 a piece. And then when you brought them back a few days later, they would give you like five bucks back. So you basically got to use the record for the whole weekend um, for $2. So, I didn't rent this, but you could rent or you could buy. But yeah, that's where I got it from. Rent a record. That was back in like 1986. First record I ever bought, UTFO. Second record I ever bought was Crush Code. Probably have to do like some weird punk rock record. This some stuff from when I was young. Old Phoenix compilation. From Placebo Records. And this was just a lot of different noise, punk rock bands, different sort of outsider music, probably from the 80s, late to the late 80s, early. Yeah, I think it was like licensed to ill or something like that. And I bought it not like when it came out or anything, but I think I bought it when I was maybe like 17 or something like that. That's when I first got a record player and started. You know, dabbling into records, and then maybe like you know, after you know, I was maybe about 18, 19, I started buying more LPs and things like that. But yeah, the first thing was uh, license to build. I think I might have got it from like one of the like Rushmore records or something like that. Wow, two, three, great by B Boys. Um, all the early cameos. Arcade Funk by Tilt. Um, I'm just thinking of the ones who used to scratch to death every day after school. Uh, the head on. I don't know. I don't know, dude. I don't know. The first record I bought was the Buddy Holly story. That uh, was the first album I bought. I don't remember the first single, but it might have been Fast Domino, because I was really, uh, I was really into Fat Domino in uh, early days. And, and before I went to grade school, uh, they they had a uh, uh, they had a dance class I think every Thursday. So uh, they needed you know music. So I started playing music for that, and then. Uh, one year, I remember it, they had a, a small, very small lecture. So they had two seatings, you know, like 12 to 1230 was the first year, 1231. So I could play records in there. And I remember, uh, you know, playing Fast On and all, uh, and Ricky Nelson and, you know, Elvis and whatever uh, at the time um, in those, uh, uh, in that situation. And that was kind of the first. Um, kind of DJing thing that I realized, well, I got to get some more records to play, you know, because I had a little just stash that I bought, and then I started to uh, uh, take it a little more seriously and, and uh, look for promo records and find out what a record distributor does, and 
So I go into Phoenix to the record distributors in Phoenix and get free records, which was another, that was almost as exciting as hearing James Brown for the first time when I realized you could actually get free records if you had a, you know, if you were a DJ. So um, early on, a friend of mine, we started a little DJ service called Have Records Will Spin, and we started in high school. I started playing in grade school, but by the time I got to high school, um, um, I met a couple other guys that were of the same mind, and they were a little more electronically oriented, and I was more vinyl oriented, so it was a great combination. It's, you know, um, I would take care of getting the vinyl, and they'd take care of the speakers and the amplifiers and the turntables and all of that. So um, all through high school, we, uh, we did a lot of, uh, a lot of record ops. Chicago, picked up a couple joints, funky Jimmy McGriff, uh, I think there's a black sheep sample on here, Mel Lewis and Grady Payne on drums, real fun, got the Donaldson joint, I know there's a, I think it's the brand new Beatles sample on here, Old Blue Note. Yeah, Lonnie Smith on the organ. The three Van Gelder. What else we got? Oh my god. We got the little rail. With the mellow mellow right on. And it has an instrumental. Real fun. I must say that this is probably the best store I've been to so far on this trip. Um, first time to Chicago. Shout out to Mediocre for hooking us up on this one. This is his old spot where he used to work. Um, the dollar record is off the chain in here. I didn't even go through them at all. I went through most of them. More, more jazz than anything in there. Insane, insane. Good example of a dollar record right there. Where else are you going to get that for a dollar? This has been reissued. I can pick it up for 15 reissued. Never. I'm going to wait for this. That's the opportunity I'm looking for. 99 cents, baby. in my bathroom. I'd be running out of all kinds of space. So I could like be sitting down taking care of my business and I could just be like looking through records like that and oh we go we on play that you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Brother's last name. 
just made it, I had to go visit some family and I made a special trip. We, we took the long ways because I wanted to stop. She goes, we're going to be late. I said, no, no, there's always time to stop. I stood in line, people get Halloween costumes. I'm glad I stood in line. I found this beautiful folk race. Folk race stuff is always really good because it's like, it's really like high-end stuff. It's like really classy stuff that they did. You know, they've done a big thing in Wax Poetics about the guy who did the album designs for all the stuff from both ways. Um, I've never pulled, I have a big stack of stuff that I'm waiting to sell to. I'm waiting for the right time to put up a big lot of both ways stuff. Because like I said, it's just really classy, like high-end stuff that kind of like collectors want. It's like they have music of the Andes and music of Africa and music of Spain and music of the Netherlands. And, and, but it's all like traditional music. They don't really get into too much pop stuff. But I found this one. It's music used in many popular television commercials. Man, and there's stuff, it's like Dan and Yogurt, Bowl of Wine, Ship and Shore Fashions, London Fog. Volkswagen, Lincoln Mercury, Ford, Xerox, Oldsmobile. This is the last track for Shell Steel Belted Tires. The Devil's Delight. You know, The Devil's Delight. And I was going to sell this one too because it's a mint. It's a stone mint. Beautiful. Like the slit, the string is still attached. label I liked a lot. I sort of, I kept noticing some good stuff was on this. But I really know very little about this uh, I think this music is called Lok Thom sometimes too. Lok Thom. I don't know too much about it, but I know that some of these records got some nice music on them. Um, this is a record I got a long time back that I like. Mark Moulin. You can see I should be treated it better, but it's got some really, really good, good music on it. Um, let's see. Oh, this is a record I had when I was younger, um, but actually it's the tape, but the music's important to me. It's Velvet Underground, Loaded. It's got good songs. It's pretty different than their other, their other records. Let's see, my earliest rec record memories go back to being a kid, Digging through my dad's record collection. He was a jazz musician. And he grew up in Chicago playing trumpet and bands and stuff all around town. So he had a big music habit. He even worked at Tower Records in downtown Tempe in the 80s. So my dad always had vinyl around. You know, my pops or my mom would let me go into his vinyl collection and pull out some records. And I can remember listening to uh, the Beatles and Beach Boys and uh, stuff like that. You know, he was a jazz head. He bought Miles Davis, John Coltrane's, and, you know, um, all the good, good classic jazz. But also, he bought some pop music for moms and, you know, I guess the family too. So he wouldn't uh, inundate us with jazz all the time. But the Beatles were one of my favorite groups, and I can remember just sitting in front of the stereo for hours with the album cover, just staring at the album cover, reading all the stuff when I could read. Or just reading, reading the notes, looking at the pictures, the artwork, and um, just getting inside the whole world of the music. And uh, you just don't get that stuff with CDs. You know, you got a little picture this big, and writing's all small. You know, you get a big record with a gatefold, you got everything right there. It's just living art in your face. And hearing the clicks and the, and the skips in the vinyl, you know, that warm feeling. Uh, I'll never forget it. I'd sit there and eat my peanut butter and jelly sandwich and listen to records and just vibe out, maybe pull out my Star Wars characters and have a little battle with my G.I. Joes and listen to Sgt. Peppers. My name is Jeff Walker, a.k.a. Jeff Jeff, a.k.a. DJ Drunk Jeff, a.k.a. Moosey. Um, I'm just kicking it. My collection is a little bit of everything up in here. Um, I want to start off with something over here. I'm gonna show you this. Uh, I know you're familiar with Wax Poetics magazines, one of my favorites. Been a subscriber forever. I got every issue, even number one and two, which are like 100 bucks a piece. I got them. Um, this Wax Poetics.
like this poster right here. This is basically a goal to me. I want every record on here. Um, one day I will have them. I don't know how hard or how much I'm gonna have to spend, but I will have them. I got a good portion of them. I probably have, I would say, 40% of them. Not quite half, but I'm getting there. Um, I do have a good chunk. Uh, there are some very valuable records on there. There's also some almost crap on there, I have to say. I hate to say it, but, you know, whatever. Um, but I do have this poster, so this is like a personal goal of mine. Um, I'll show you what I have. This is kind of crazy. I told you I was a subscriber, so they sent me this poster for being a subscriber, right? So I got my poster in the mail, it was all messed up. The whole corner was torn off. So I emailed dude and uh, told him, and they were real cool, they sent me a new one. So I used my old one as a little checklist, so here it is. It's up in this little closet. So everything right here with an X on it, I have. There's no X, I ain't got it yet, but I will. But there's this common record, that's a common record, I don't have it. Why? I don't know. I see it every day for three bucks. I'll get it. That's a common record. I see that every day for three bucks. Never seen that, 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 you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Well, the Nirvana, that's $100. Uh, one day, one day I'll get it. Hopefully I don't have to spend 100 but I'll get it. Definitely a personal goal. This right here, just caught that. I just got, just got that. Just got that, actually for a dollar in Milwaukee. Actually, no, I take that back in Chicago. Hyde Park Records right there, dollar. Um, got that at the B-Swap Me Sealed, what, eight months ago or something like that. I just got that, that came through Rock Zone, Re Rock Zone Records where I work on the side. Just popped, popped that right there. Just got that at Rock Zone when I got back from Milwaukee, so. You know, it's all good. It's coming. They're all coming. All coming. Oh, this is a record that's cool to me. Alpha the Night from Psychic TV. And this is a group that I liked a lot growing up as a kid, and I still do. Robbie Crystal and Psychic TV. A lot of this stuff related to these things. But uh, this was made for a dance troupe. And it's got some really spooky stuff. Like, basically, music, it sounds like someone doing things inside water in a cave. That song's pretty good. And then there's also a song on here that just sounds like crazy electronic beats, but it's all based off of uh, like Haitian rhythms. This is an interesting record, actually. Oh, I don't have it, but this is a... Uh, there's a good movie record that does... What's the name? Soul Pass? Soul Pass? This has some good beats. The Android Sisters, on sleep. Good sideboard rap. So I've been collecting records since 1986, roughly. Um, uh, I hip hop, of course. Uh, Run DMC, Raising L, uh, Houdini, Back in Black. You know what I mean? Back in the days when they, when the Warehouse and Sam Goody and all them carried records, and I was able to go to Sam Goody's and buy Too Short, Born to Mac on vinyl, which is incredible. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, I, I started learning about beats and everything, and I remember going to thrift stores. And, 
you know, the late 80s, early 90s, and finding Slat of Family Stone Records, and I thought it was the man, because I had sing a simple song on vinyl, and I knew nothing about it until I found it. I'm like, wow, this was that song, and blah, 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 whatever. Um, now I know a little bit. I don't know a lot. I'm, just, I'm getting there. I'm learning everything. Um, but, you know, like, I just got... Some Phoenix new wave music. When I was a kid, I didn't know what to make of it. But it's pretty good. It's pretty ahead of its time. You know, as you got older, you start hearing hip hop and the samples, and you're like, man, my dad has that record. So um, that was always that always tripped me out. That you know, he kind of was into something that blossomed into what I was into. Because if there had been no jazz, no rock, no soul, there'd be no hip hop. So basically. My da- I owe it to my dad. He gave me the vinyl virus. That's what I call it. Because um, I think my mom yelled at him a couple times for buying too many records. And uh, I think he got in trouble for it. I think he probably still does to this day. But uh, what's great about him San Diego is I get to make him mixtapes of stuff that maybe he didn't buy back in the day. You know, when he's buying the straightforward jazz, you know, there's a lot of interesting funky jazz that maybe he wasn't paying attention to because he was a pretty hardcore cat. But now he loves that stuff, and uh, through re- reissues and whatnot, and me just making the tapes, he uh, he's discovered a whole other world of jazz, which I think is pretty awesome. He gave something to me, and now it's my turn to give something back to him, which I think is pretty amazing and awesome. And I enjoy doing that. He always gets a birthday mix CD or something for Christmas. And one of my best memories, my dad and I going to see James Brown at a casino. And that was the first time I ever saw my dad get out of his chair. And, he was raising the roof, dancing, he bummed us the stage. Dude. I've never seen my dad do that. He was probably in his 60s when he did that, and that blew my mind. Uh, and that was one of my, one of the most special occurrences in my life and most special days is sharing a James Brown concert with my dad. So uh, I, I've got to give uh, thanks and praises to my father for showing me uh, what good music is all about. who own this place, Marie is obviously Mrs. Henderson and Mr. Henderson put her on the corner. Uh, they've been in the business for since the 60s. Hey, what's up, y'all? This is your man, E, kicking it live from the west side of Chicago at the legendary Out of the Past Records. Talking about digging deep in the crates for those unorthodox breaks. I gotta tell you, this is, uh, you know, one of those places kind of a blast in the past, man. There's not many places like this left, man. I've seen DJ Shadow talk about a place in San Francisco. It's kind of like this. It's kind of like accumulation of like 30 years of stuff, man. And all we do is talk to people who like to come here, get filthy, dirty, digging through, you know, tons of crap. But, um, man, this place still got gems. You know, but I talked to people who dug in this place 10 years back before I, I even moved to Chicago. And they said, oh, man, this place was big and stuff like that. Two weeks ago, I mean, I, I found 
brand, basically a brand new copy of Soul Johnson. This is because I'm black, just chilling on the shelf. So I mean, this place has got bomb jams from all sorts of shit. So whenever people come in here and say, "Man, I hit that place ten years ago," you know, man, the crazy stuff. When you dig deep, you're unbelievable what you're on earth, man. There's people going to other towns, other parts of the country. It's all for that fix, man. Digging, getting dirty. Find them that record, that jazz record, that disco record, that record from Japan that no one knows about. <laughs> but man, keep digging, keep getting dirty, man. Analog out. Central Phoenix Italian American Club since they've been doing this. Came up with forty dollars today. Which, you know, I ain't a whole lot of money, but it goes pretty far out here. So going through uh, some forty five second first one, some soul, funk R and B, copy of Brenda George for two bucks. Nothing too serious, but it sounds good. I got a nice Joy Division uh, bootleg seven inch. That's got uh, some some ill electro style stuff that apparently was never released. A good old these are my folks records, my dad's old ska records. Ska compilations, and he's coming useful. I was just playing these like uh, night before last. Good old fast crazy ska music from time to time. I got turned on to chess checker stacks, full and Atlantic, I mean, all these wonderful labels that you wouldn't necessarily, necessarily hear here on the radio, but um, there were always, there were plenty of promo copies to go around. So then that's kind of when I paid a lot more attention to R&B and soul. And got into, and got, James Brown was always there, but got into Otis and, and uh, the Stack sound and you know, some of the Motown things too, because uh, as people have discovered, especially the English world, some of the best Motown stuff with the, with the non hits, the stuff that didn't get on the radio, is the most collectible stuff. Craigslist for people selling collections and coming to dollar stores and then we, you know what I mean, like we're turning those around. We should be the ones dictating. We're the DJs to begin with, you know what I mean? Like we're the ones that are supposed to be telling people what's hot to begin with. So the fact that, like this is almost taking it to the next level. It's like digging, it's like we should be dictating to everybody else what's hot. It shouldn't be some, like you said earlier, man, no disrespect. It shouldn't be some some kid, some, you know, young, camel faced kid behind the counter that's just been in it for a year or so. You know, you know, working at a Zio or something like that or a bookman, we don't, you know, I don't want them to tell me what's hot. I'm supposed to be telling them what's hot. I've been, I've been a DJ for 10 plus years. When I first came into digging, it was like, like just the, the word digging, like, to me, it just meant that you were supposed to go out and grind. And, and I spent the first couple of years, like, hitting a good little here and there, hitting the Salvation Army, hitting places where I remember seeing records as a kid and having really bad luck. And I just, you know, I, I, I can't remember, I can't 
can't remember the exact time, the exact place, or the exact one, or the exact location, but I just, there had to be a time when I came up and I said, this is what it's all about. This is what, this is what it's all about. It's like, finding that, that stack, man, at a Goodwill, just at the right time, at the right place, you go in there, man, and it's the right afternoon, and they just price the big stack, and it's coming out of the cart, and you just look at it, man, and you just see the stacks, and everything's 99 cents, and, and it, it just hit me right then, I was like, this is what it's all about, but it takes time, it takes dedication, it takes grind, it takes gas, you know what I mean, it takes a lot of patience, I, I live for it, dude, I live for it. I can't be more passionate about it than I am right now, but just I just live for it, dude, I live for that feeling. Pulled out his wallet, dude. He had a list like, like this. You know, it was just like a piece of paper folded over so many times that it was like this. And he came out of his wallet. He's like, "This is my list, man." <laughs> I'm like, "Dude, you're gonna spend the rest of your life chasing that list." You know what I mean? So I just, I just go out and then whatever I come up on, I know I've come up. I've come up on butters and I've come up on shit too. You know, to me, it's a learning process. To me, it's 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 so much. Like there's just so much in it. Like I've taught myself everything. You know. So, Everything that my name stands for, you know, has not has been not only with DJing and production, but also with records too. Like nobody taught me anything. When I first started taking over the wax poetics, there wasn't any dang video, there was nothing like that, dude. Everything I had to just teach myself. And I attribute a lot of that to just digging, staying in the stores and and, and, and you know, finding a piece and, and taking it home and listening to it and be like, oh man, so this producer, this is somebody to look for and and um, you know, or this this guy plays drums on this record and, and that's why, you know, that's what I like about it with the drum record. If I find another record with this guy, you know it's going to be solid. And so it's, it's you know it's a learning it's a learning process. There's so much about it that I just love. And for that, it's like it's worth it for me to stay in the spots. Go to the shows, really makes your money go farther. You can negotiate with people, so I'm feeling that. You know, everyone wants to claim that you can find anything online, like you just download everything available. It's not necessarily true because there's a hell of shit on vinyl that you're not going to find on the internet. And plus, you know, I like having shitty records too that you're not going to find online. Just find just a little guitar or whatever I'm going to be sampling. You know, you want to have stuff at your disposal that's going to be unique and individual coming from the DJ producer standpoint. But again, man, it's about making your money, you know, work for you. Pay 99 cents for a download of a song, you know, five whole hours. Uh, obviously, records aren't going anywhere. Prices might change, but there's still a lot of volume out there. So, not too many, like, holy grails I'm looking for. Just, like, finding new shit on the uh, Got some OG cats out here in the crowd. Some OG solo doo wop singers. Other musicians. Dudes have been selling records for like 50 years almost. Uh, AZ DJs. It's, it's a good spot to be. Soul. Just old soul fun. Whatever. I like everything. It's always a like, beautiful song. Looking for some drums, snares, kicks. Name it. I'm always finding something. Some sort of flavor. LP. Sorry, Mike. Two years ago, I was with my man. We're not even allowed to know what it drives. We went to a house call because they still got a store called Bucky Mambo. We went to a house call. There was a lady who had a store in the seven. So he was digging right here and he liked different things to me and whatever. He was looking for psych or whatever. So he pulls out the small snaps for $10, puts it back, sends out whatever. That's how she wrote it. That's how I got my big copy of small snaps. Rest in peace. The first album I ever bought was Crocodile Rock by Noah Cowan. The lady and I played it to death, man. The lady had a store, some store in the 70s, but it was predominantly black. So she would have records like Ultimate Spin, she would be $40. Well, that's you know, a good story. Right. Oh, yeah, no, that no, story no, is a good story. No, so yeah, I just wanted to arrange like Axel Rods and all that. It was nothing to her. So the Axel Rods was all five and below. 
so how you gonna buy a skull snap to take off? Like a crazy thing is a wet dream. <laughs> yeah. I'll show you a couple of my 45s here. Um, I don't have the biggest collection, but I do have some bangers. Um, got a couple boxes, I pulled a couple joints out. Um, this one's real important to me. This is a promo radio station copy of Epic Records. Um, I don't really hear. It's a group called Kaleidoscope. Um, I live in Arizona. I live in Tempe. This song is called Tempe, Arizona. And from what I know, this is kind of a rock band. And uh, I guess for some reason, this song is just super funky. There's drums everywhere. Um, it's amazing. It's probably one of my most precious records I have, actually. And one of my favorite records was... Uh was uh, the Soul Twist by King Curtis, man. I mean, I, I just played that. I just loved that record. It was a great, great dance record, and uh, it just had such a, a funky, super sound, and uh, I just loved it, man. And uh, uh, it got, wasn't on the radio here, but we, we just had a great time because, uh, you know, when you get free records, you, you can afford to, uh, uh, to uh, pull the hits out and, and find stuff. We certainly weren't in a position to make any hits necessarily, but uh, we turned the Tempe High kids on to a lot of a lot of great music that uh, they never would have heard before. It's a really good album. I haven't heard too much about it, but it's called Rock and other four-letter words for like spoken word sound. So it was about maybe three years back, I, uh, I called a guy who, uh, he was a DJ, he also ran a record pool out in Toledo, Ohio. So I asked him what he has, and he's like, oh, we have about like, you know, 50 to 75,000 uh, 12 inches. And so I was like, what is it, like 80s and 90s? He's like, yeah, it's basically all 80s and 90s, um, classics and all that stuff. So talks to me and we go down there and we get there and uh, basically all that's in there is like a thousand twelve inches from like 2003 to 2005 all commercial bullshit and, and then he's like oh tomorrow we can take you to another place and then he stood us up and we ended up in a blizzard it took us like 10 hours to drive back and the shit took us like four and a half so that was like one of the like nights Him and his brother actually went down to Memphis to do a buy, and then when they got there, they called the guy and just said that he sold the collection like the day before, and uh, never like cared to call and hear Tom. So sometimes when you get out there on the road, it's, it's dangerous. You gotta, you really gotta line up a bunch of stuff, otherwise you get screwed. <laughs> uh, as far as collections, like my whole apartment is filled. Storage is it started out with just just like every school breaks, drums, got into rock. And now it's just I'm a soul head. I'm always a soul head, soul funk. I try to have even collection. I like classic hip hop. Anything that I could use. I like a, you know, some common joints, uh, hot pants, Bobby Burr. Uh, I got this like test pressing of Memphis Soul Stew King Curtis, the one-sided Atlantic Records, which is way dope. You know, some Baby Huey, you know what I'm saying, some Disco, some Fatback. Um, I, I pulled this out just because I love the way that record companies are trying to get extra sales and they're putting out 45 as a promotional item. You buy the album, you get this, right?
specialty is pretty much like uh, old school uh, hip hop from the 80s up until like the mid 90s, late 90s for the most part. And let's see, what is a good story? Let's see, going out to the Bronx and, and digging, uh, ended up meeting a guy named Harvey Frierson or whatever, and uh, he uh, did some internship in the 80s for like DNA International. He was working like side by side with Paul C learning how to do production and stuff like that, but he went on to make um, a couple of like independent records, uh, like one being uh, Pilon, uh, 360 Degrees is the name of the record, um, the other one being Sport Junior Mastermind. And it was just like a really good up-tempo like, hip-hop release, um, which I think had Paul C production on it as well. It was a really desirable record. but. Um, he also had a, a young brother by the name of Young Lord who did like production for, for Bad Boy Records. So we got to go through all of his records and uh, that was a good time because you know we got to see all the different like Bronx things and sample records and things. So, so yeah, that, that happened maybe about a couple of years back. All right, I have a cool story about this. Uh, I got some of these from an older poet years ago. I've lived in downtown Phoenix for most of my life, and uh, this was probably 15 years ago down here. They found these records. This guy named Olin, this older poet, was down to, in downtown Phoenix, and he saw where this old Channel 10 news building had been knocked down. And there was like a big construction pit, and he saw a bunch of records down there in the dirt. So he like hopped the fence and went down there and started looking, and there was a whole, whole bunch of these from the news station somehow that had been thrown away. They hadn't been thrown into like a dumpster, they were just in the dirt. So this guy, Olin, there's probably this many of these things. He stacks them up, he realizes, this guy's on foot, he realizes that to take them home, he can't even carry all these albums at once. So he takes half of these records, stashes them in a trash can downtown, takes the bus to his house holding like, you know, this many, as many as he can carry on the bus goes back to the garbage can, gets the rest of the records, and gets them home. And then he's just sitting on them. And I meet up with this guy, because I was DJing at this coffee shop, the Willow House that's across the street from where we were at the coffee shop. And uh, he's telling me how he has all these old CBS or Capitol records. So I went to his house and I listened through all of them. And I got them for a good price, I forget what. You know, fella stuff is it's not the easiest to come. I found both of these at Brooklyn for two bucks a pop, just right in the front, no one had touched them. I found this fella at a dig spot that I go to, the same thing for like 50 cents. I walk into Brooklyn's, and, I, and, I, and as soon as I, like, you walk towards the record, and you see the counter, the record counter, and they have this display up on top, and they have, like, dolls and shit up there. And they've had, like, they, they put records up there, but they've had, like, the same five records there for, like, Honestly, for like the last six months, the same five records were up there. But like right before that was when I got this. And I walked in, and as soon as I walked in, that's the first place I look when I walk in the store, I look up at the counter, I look up at the, the shelving above the register, and I see this sitting there, and I'm like, God damn it. Sure enough, it had an $8 tag in it, which to be honest, is still, is still kind of high for Bookman's. Damn kind of high. Look, the, well, you know, like east side of those guys are probably the prices at 20 regardless of the condition, 20 30 easily. The point was that I got a great box at Bookman's, and it wasn't as high as I thought it was going to be. Like I said, I, the fact that they had it displayed up there, I figured someone, somebody, nobody over there knows anything about records. I figured somebody caught up to what this was and like priced it all high. But, so that was a time when I didn't pay too much for it. I was very, I was, I was very excited about that. For everybody who doesn't know, this is Dorothy's Heart from Dorothy Ashley. Very cool record. But everybody knows what it is. Everybody knows that record. I'm like a huge Beastie Boys fan, and I've been like collecting their records since day one, pretty much. And uh, one of my favorite, one of my favorite Beastie Boy records is the In Sound from Way Out. And uh, when this came out back in uh, back in like the mid '90s, sometime '94. Um, they only pressed up 5,000 copies of this worldwide, and they put them all on, you know, gold vinyl, and 
and they number them too. So I went to the store called Atomic Records and they had it in there for like 20 bucks and I didn't want to pay 20 bucks. I thought that was too much. So I was like, I just wait, you know, until I find it again. Well, needless to say, I didn't see it again for years and years. And so um, one summer, me and a couple of buddies were, we were in South Dakota somewhere and DJing at some club and earlier that day, we uh, found this record store, went in there, and they got all the records in the back behind this big gate. And, um, I actually found this. That's where I found this record. And it was like 11, 12 bucks. It could have been 100 bucks at that time. I still would have bought it. Um, but I finally found it. I was so happy. It was years later. And um, I grabbed it. This is like number... 1,242 out of 5,000, and uh, I finally, finally got it, one of my most favorite records, it's probably one of most, the most prized records in my collection, um, BC Boys, In Sound For Way Out, and I have like at least a crate and a half of just Beastie Boy records, so yeah, this 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 is one of my, one of my favorite finds of all time. There's a great story behind this record, you know, I, I went down to Tucson, for like an art fair with my girlfriend and it was hitting spots, just a few spots like along this little walkway and I, and I walked into some, some they looked like a salvation army, it was like a huge garage and they just had a, a grocery cart full of beat up records and jackets all bent and hanging and stuff and then there was a small little shelf and I, and this was the only thing I pulled, I pulled this in like a Henry Mancini that I didn't have or something out of there, just because I knew it was going to be cheap, I took it up to the counter and you know, it was like it was like a dollar total, and I only had a debit card. You know, they wouldn't take any it was less than like five dollars. So the woman let me walk with this record on the strength, and I was like pretty pretty amazed. And it was the funny story is that she actually was like, "Oh man, I have this record at home. These guys are this is great. These guys are great. That's a great record." She just said something like she knew this band, or this was one of her favorite bands, or something. And I kind of you know, there's and, and the chances of her actually having this. I, I mean, not to. Again, sound like too much of an elitist, but the chances of her actually having this at home is pretty slim. But um, it turned out to be a great record, man. And, and um, I mean, it's, it's cool. It's not the greatest record. It's not the funniest record I've ever heard. But it's just one of those stories, man. That you just, you, you know, you never get that experience. You never get that experience when you go into a Z or something, you know, because they're gonna have this on the wall for twenty or thirty bucks, just on the strength of what it looks like. You know what I mean? You go, you know, I got, you know, I went into a little. Salvation Army spot that had a box boxes of records for like a quarter a piece and this lady let me you know 50 cents excuse me because the total was a dollar but she let me walk with this because it just was no big deal you never get a story like that you never get an experience like that out of a Zia or a Bookman's or or, an, or any record store for that matter you know um, I got Sonic U stuff I mean for days that's my favorite rock band of all time I got tons and tons and tons um, Thurston Moore, I got Joy Division, New Order, so I'm not just one dimensional man, I got it all. I, I like I like everything. Um I love this, that's dope. Three parts, new order. I've had a lot of records over the years that um I've learned to appreciate after getting them. And um I uh, you know, I grew up in Tempe and, and was playing but um, then I found out a lot of cool records were actually made in Phoenix at Audio Recorders. And, and um, so uh, one of the groups that I did have and I'd heard of was, uh, was Eddie and Ernie. And uh, uh, they were a soul duo here in the 70s along the lines of Sam and Dave. And they did uh, some recording here, but they recorded both in L.A. and New York and, uh, sh and uh, maybe... South Carolina, they they uh, kind of recorded all over, but but anyway, um, I'd done some work with a company called Ace Records in, in, in England, and of course the English have appreciated our music, rockabilly, whatever it is, so uh, a lot more than we did, and so a lot of those companies were were uh, looking for masters and putting out um, CDs uh, in Europe long before they'd ever get an American release. So OIC had been here for years, and I was talking to Gene Blue one time, and I said, you know, um, this, this guy in England 
was asking about, you know, Eddie and Ernie, and uh, and uh, wanted to know about Ernie. Thought he was dead, and he's oh no no, he's around here, man. I just saw him last week. You know, I go what? And uh, so so yeah, he's he's here. He's, he's on the streets. You know, he doesn't have a fixed address or a phone or anything. And uh, he said, I'll, I'll next time I run into him, I'll I'll give you a call. I said, oh, you got to. And so I mean, literally several months later. Um, I got a call from uh, Gene Blue, and he said, hey, um, um, Ernie, Ernie was here. I told him you're looking for him. He's coming back tomorrow at noon, so why don't you come down here, and uh, you can meet him. And so I did. I, I went down to OIC the next day, and uh, I, I met Ernie and uh, took him out to lunch. I mean, he was literally living on the street. I mean, he had a, he had a shopping cart, and but then, in a way, that's where he wanted to be. You know, he'd... Uh, He'd get a little money, and then he'd, uh, you know, have too many drinks or whatever, and then kind of, you know, lay low for a while. And, and so um, I, the most moving moment for me was sitting across from him at Denny's in downtown Phoenix with Dave Godin's liner notes from some of the CDs that he'd done. And Dave was describing how... The music of Eddie and Ernie was so great and so emotional, and, and what it meant to him. Uh, the point is that um, he did receive some recognition and, uh, and some credit and acknowledgement for all the great songs that he did. And uh, so that was probably one of my biggest thrills as far as uh, biggest finds was actually to find him in Bakersfield, California. This is uh, my old roommate that I used to live with is in this band called Active Ingredients. And uh, it's on the Beer City Records. And uh, this is this was pressed up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And uh, funny thing is, I never owned this in my life. And I move out here, and I'm looking through this, and I see my old roommate sitting on, passed out in front of our old couch. That's hilarious to me. Good catch, buddy. That's what it's all about, man. I got my two favorite things, records and playing with the dog. What made a dope DJ back in the day, to me, was having that that one uh, that one record that no one else had. When you drop that, everyone would go crazy. Ice Cream Man, what up? Anyways, uh... That's what that's what separated good DJs from bad DJs. Your vinyl selection, and nowadays you got cats. They get together and they'll take their hard drive and they'll share it. So it's like every DJ has the same exact songs. And you go out to this club, you probably gonna hear the same stuff that this club's playing. There's not that much um, uniqueness anymore, I don't think. And um, I think that's where the vinyl really came into play because you couldn't just copy your record. I put it on a turntable that night, you know, it's nowadays, you just go online, you hit a button, you got the song, and you're getting songs that people have spent their whole life chasing, and uh, that's what used to be so fun about nights, you know, you just, you wait to see what your man was going to play, and what he, what new joints he had discovered or brought out, or what records he had that you didn't have, and you know what I mean, that's what made a, a DJ dope, and you know, unfortunately I think with Serato, it is a great tool, but also I think it is dumbing down. DJ culture, I'd like to see uh, a little more creative, creativeness when people are using Serato. And um, I plan to when I get it, so um, be on the lookout. But uh, until then, I'll just keep rocking my vinyl. And I always will rock vinyl for forever. So uh, that's something I always, always do. Buy records, it's in my blood, I can't help it. Uh, once you get the vinyl virus, it's with you forever. So that's what's up. As far as a passion, probably. Soul and R&B, James Brown and Live at the Apollo was the first real record that just, you know, fried my mind when, when, um, when I heard that. And I heard it on the radio and ran out and bought a copy and uh, then just listened to it over and over and over again. It was just, uh, that was a mind-altering experience. And then I uh, actually got a set of drums around that time and I sat and played drums to James Brown live at the Apollo trying to figure out what the drummer was doing and trying to uh, to duplicate that on my own set of drums. So. Record collecting is definitely a passion of mine. 
um, my love for music started at a very young age for me. Um, my father was a, a jazz enthusiast. He had a, a pretty nice jazz collection, and my older sisters, you know, were into all of the, you know, the P funk and Cameo or Twin and Fire, all of that stuff. So I, I grew up, you know, really getting down to the Jackson Five and Ohio players and all that kind of stuff. To this day, I would say that you know, soul music. Definitely my favorite type of music, you know, there's nothing like hearing um, Patti LaBelle or Gladys Knight or, you know, the, the, the struggle and the pain in Marvin Gaye's voice when you hear him. There's just nothing like it. And, you know, to hear that kind of stuff on a, you know, on a disc, you know, with the little crackles and pops and, you know, you're looking at the artwork while you're listening to it. There's just nothing like it. You don't get that kind of feeling from any other type of uh, musical media. And uh, that kind of drives me to, to continue to be on the search for that next find, that next dig. You know, I've, uh, I've gotten the opportunity to dig all over the country and I haven't even, you know, really gotten started yet. Um, and collecting records goes along with collecting just about anything. I know I'm a, I'm a freak when it comes to collecting stuff, you know, uh, along with records, you know, I got the boom boxes and kicks, so many kicks, I don't know, and old toys and, you know, cards, you know, uh, marbles, <laughs> pairs, heads, you know, old magazines, um, musical memorabilia, it just goes on and on and on, and, uh, but you know, this is, this is what I love, I could, I could die in this room right now, this is like everything to me, so, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep at it, man, this is, this is what I love. Music, you know, I, I dig it, and I've got I, I just say I have a passion for, you know, for music. Of course, that's always subjective, but, um, you know, to narrow it down, uh, there's just too much great stuff out there. 